Thomas, the International Online Forum. Uh, Saturday, May 6th. Good morning to everybody. It is 11 a.m. here on the East Coast. Beautiful day here in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. That's where uh, I am uh, I am from and live. Uh, we have a star-studded cast here today. Just want to do a, a quick disclaimer here. Everything you see here today is provided for educational purposes. Um, decisions are yours and yours alone. Enjoy today's presentation. Uh, Star-studded cast here today, guys. So here is the agenda uh, that we are going to follow here today. Um, again, my name is Jerry D'Ambrosio. I'm the manager of educational content here at VectorVest. Uh, we have Mr. Stan Heller, who is the uh, uh, our consultant for Canada. We have Dr. David Paul, managing director for VectorVest UK, and Ms. Susan Hayes, who's our managing director for Europe. She currently resides in uh, in Ireland. David's in in, uh, in London. So uh, all across the world here delivering, uh, hopefully, which is great content for you guys here today. What I'm going to do, I'll be your host for today. I'm going to pass things over to Stan in a moment. I want to take you guys through the agenda, talk about some announcements that we have uh, uh, coming up. Um, we do have our LA two-day investment seminar. That'll be uh, in just a few weeks. You guys are probably familiar with our Tampa two-day investment seminar, one of our flagship events that we deliver every year, beginning of the year in January in Tampa, Florida. With that event, it is not only an in-person event, but it's a live stream event as well. With the LA two-day investment seminar, it is just an in-person event. So if you're in the LA area, if you live in the LA area, you ever want to, you want to take a vacation to the LA area, in a couple of weeks, we will be there, the Crown Plaza, Los Angeles Harbor uh, Harbor, Hotel, Harbor Hotel. Um, you can register, go to vectorvest.com slash LA. And the uh, instructors that will be at the LA event will be uh, Ray Clark. Ray Clark is the Vice President of Educational Services. Jim Penna, uh, who is the Manager of Retirement Services. Glenn Tompkins, uh, Senior Instructor with VectorVest. And uh, Steve Chappell, who is the Director of Trading Systems Development here at VectorVest. So great cast of instructors. Everybody brings a little something different. Uh, to the table. So it is a two-day event. And again, register. Uh, if you want to register, you can go to vectorvest.com uh, slash LA. Um, all right. Without further ado, guys, I'm going to hang around. I'll be in the background. If you guys have any questions, I'll be here. Um, but what I want to do now is I want to introduce Mr. Stan Heller. Again, Stan is our consultant, VectorVest consultant for uh, our VectorVest Canadian market. You guys that live in Canada know Stan very well. Um, and he's going to take us through some of the global markets. He'll go through the color guards and really important segment here in, in, uh, in his presentation is the emotional market cycle. And he'll uh, he'll discuss where we stand in terms of the MTI indicator, the buy to sell ratio indicator, uh, just to help you guys along with that. So welcome, Stan. Thank you for being here once again. Hey, thank you very much, Jerry. Appreciate that uh, wonderful introduction uh, to uh, the forum. And I think we're all ready to go. I'm just waiting for my screen to take hold and we'll get started here. Nice to see everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, the International Online Forum. It's one of my favorite webinars or events that we have in VectorVest. I love the international flavor and I recognize uh, so many names from Canada, but also all around the world. So it's really, really great to see you all. And I think it's really important to understand what's happening in the global markets. And so I think it's a real treat that we have, uh, you know, guest presenters that can share that with you. And I'll start it off by looking at the color guards as we go. Uh, so first of all, uh, I'm just going to see if my screen works and make sure everybody can hear me okay. Looks like, uh, looks like we can, looks like my screen is working, so that's great. I wanted to start off before I get into the global market update with the Color Guard report. Uh, I listened last night to Jim Penna's presentation on Go for the Gold, and I think this is a must watch uh, for everyone, uh, how Jim used the US dollar, uh, the uh, a bond a fund, uh, and of course the Huey, the Midas touch, with the Midas touch, and how he's able to get the uh, the heads up on on direction for gold for entries and exits, and then he even enhanced it in my view by showing how the Huey works with the near perfect indicator, delivering some excellent exit uh, opportunities when gold pulled back for a short period, but it was a strong pullback, and then he showed the next resumption with the near perfect 
indicator entry. So if you missed it, you really want to go ahead and, and watch Go for the Gold. You just go to the timing tab down here at the bottom of my screen. You can kind of see it there and click on the special presentation video and that'll launch that for you. So let's get going and have a look at the color guards. You can see Canada. Um, we had a terrific January, then we pulled back and then in March, around March 27th, we started to see some green lights uh, appear in the price column. Buy sell ratio was extremely low and we started to pull back up a little bit. And then lately we pulled back. You can see all the red in the buy sell ratio uh, column and RT to that extent as well. Um, but we had a very strong day Friday as we did uh, globally. Uh, just some some really good news out of the U.S. with the jobs, the non-farm payrolls, and and some other uh, earnings releases that were strong. With Apple kind of leading the way, uh, so things were looking better. We're up 5.53 percent year to date. You can see in April we wound up closing up 1.15 percent. So that was that was excellent. We're still in a confirmed down call. We got the DEW down on. Uh, Thursday, so caution is still advised, and you can see in this this is uh, this little narrative at the or below the um, the color guard report is from the market strategy in Canada, and it says let's proceed with caution and heed the advice of the color guard in the upcoming week. We'll look at the market timing graph in a minute, and you can see we might be ready to continue the breakout. Uh, based on support and resistance, but um, we'll 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 have to use caution. And the U.S. side, and of course, David does such a wonderful job speaking about the U.S. and the U.K. But um, as in Canada, the color guard is neutral. Vectorvest not advocate buying any stocks, and you can see that big jump in the buy sell ratio in the U.K. going from 0 0.20. To 0.34, similar big jump in Canada, or sorry, in the U.S. I should say here, similar jump in uh, Canada as well. So, uh, so big jump in in the breadth of the market rally. We'll see if it can continue. The MTI is up a little bit. We didn't actually get a primary wave in either Canada or the U.S., and we still have that confirmed down call. But there is a bullish divergence in the U.S. market with the buy sell ratio and RT moving higher. Um, even as price was falling. So that's encouraging. And uh, also the Derby searches are all bullish bottom fishing. So looking a little bit better there. April closed lower and year to date is just 3.54% on the US side. Now here are the other three countries uh, that we serve with VectorVest and leading off with Australia, 4.24% year to date. And you can see the buy sell ratio really struggling here for the breadth of the market. Uh, like Canada, heavily um, uh, commodity based, especially in the precious metals and uh, and mining. And so the buy sell ratio having a tough time getting going here. Australia has been in a confirmed down call um, for the last four days. Before that, we had some primer wave up signals but they didn't last and we got into that confirmed down call so really the color guard is mildly bearish and i think we need to be really cautious in australia and again it just kind of signals what what's going on in the world markets and we received that confirmed down on tuesday may 2nd so caution is advised Europe color guard is mildly bullish. So <laughs> Europe is the leader in terms of the gain year to date, 7.38% had a better April than the other uh, countries. One green light in the price column, but still in a confirmed down call the last four days. So the, the strategy section in, the U, in Europe says the bulls and bears are duking it out. Stay tuned to the color guard next week for further direction. And then the UK, and of course, David will talk more completely about this, but year to date up 4.77%. Color Guard is neutral, and um, we're in that confirmed down situation in the UK as well. There's that bullish divergence between two of our other key indicators. Price is one of them, and then the other two, uh, buy sell ratio and RT. And the price of the UK suggests that upside potential outweighs 
downside risks. So I, I think there's some room for optimism on the overall global markets. And we'll take a look at the, um, the Canadian market timing graph in a minute. But uh, I think there's room for some optimism, but an abundance of caution is also required. So when we talk about the emotional market cycle, you can Google emotional market cycle and come up with a, a thousand iterations of what we see in front of us on this graph. And But it, it fits and ties in so well with the MTI that we had our graphics department uh, sort of bring it together with the MTI. And you can see we're still kind of in this early phase, the blast off phase of the MTI. Uh, you know, in Canada, we're at 0.85 on the MTI. In the US, we're at 0.75. So we're not quite in the trending phase, which happens after we get past sort of uh, closer to that 1.0 and above. So we're not in the trending phase. We're a long ways away from the overbought conditions that we see up at the top, and we're closer to the blast off phase. So that's what gives me a little bit of optimism that we could break out and we need to be ready for that. Uh, Friday was a big day. I think it was a bit of a surprise for a lot of folks on Friday, just how strong it was. But in Canada, the buy-sell ratio was, again, getting quite low at 0.23, uh, which signals uh, extreme overbought, uh, or sorry, oversold condition. And we might have expected a little bit of a rally. So that's where things are at with the emotional market cycle. Uh, caution is advised. All right, and then my essay from Friday, I wanted to kind of showcase the different um, sorts that we can research so quickly in the Derby. The Derby is known for uh, being such a, a, a benefit for short-term traders looking for trade ideas, uh, sort of betting on the horse that's out of the barn the fastest uh, uh, it, during the market uh, turn. But it's also a terrific uh, research tool. And so I wanted to really look at the the different sorts that are possible that, that maybe showed up with some leaders. So I did that using the buy and hold analysis mold. I thought it was a, a really revealing type of uh, mode to analyze these sorts. So here I looked from March 27th to March 1st when I wrote my essay. Things have gone up a little bit from there, even though we had that big down day on Thursday. Uh, but here are the different sorts that I've showcased here in the essay. And of course, everybody has access to all of our VectorVest countries. So you can just log in to Canada, click on the Canadian flag if you want to read this essay in more detail. And of course, you'll get the slides on Monday, I believe it is, uh, when uh, VectorVest sends them out. And then I go through a description of some of the major um, sorts that you might uh, want to consider. And I've already had emails from people who appreciated this approach, have, have sort of made a, a copy of, of, the, of the different sorts so they can um, kind of experiment with them further and, and so on. So I think it was a worthwhile exercise. <laughs> so let me just now very quickly go into Oh, and by the way, yeah, there is a there is a derby trial. Uh, it's a 30 day trial. Uh, I should mention that before I go into the market timing. It, you'll come up to see if you click on that link, you'll see this special offer. It includes real time membership in the jockey club and it's a 30 day free trial. And if you take the trial, I just always remind people, make sure you diarize the end date of your trial and make a decision. If it's not making money for you, if you're not getting the information you think you should be getting, then just cancel before the end of the trial and uh, no harm, no foul. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now let's go into the program very quickly here. Just a couple of things that I wanted to show you. So I'm going to go into VectorVest Canada. And the nice thing is the Derby works the same way in the US market. It is a real time Derby, so it does require that real time subscription. But let's go in and this is the methodology that I used. I clicked on the Derby tab up at the top. I selected instead of today's Derby, which is the results from Friday, and I just clicked on the buy and hold mode. It's that second or third drop down here. Click on that. And then for the date, I went back 
to that March 27th uh, green light in the price column, the green light buyer signal. And it was a pretty good signal right up until um, really today, even though we had a, a difficult week, it's been a pretty good signal. So there's the March 27th, and I'll just leave it at March 5th for now. The results will be a bit different than my essay, obviously, with three or four more trading days in there. But let's just have a look. So, and let me change the price to all. So that'll get us back to what I was looking at on Monday when I wrote the essay. So here's Angel Angel's Wings, and you can see now with four extra days, the, the strategies actually uh, improved. They kind of fell back quite a bit uh, to May 1st. And then you can see in the, in the um, equity curve that it rallied up uh, to where we see it now at about 18%. Uh, percent. But what I wanted to show you, so we have two-door gold, we have new gold, Calibri Mining. I'll just look at these three, plus the weakness here of ARG. So let's just right-click now after highlighting them by clicking on the uh, control tab and just highlighting the symbol. And we can view the stock graph. And I like to see these with the near-perfect indicator. Everybody has this graph layout. It's under, it's under graph layouts. And there's the near perfect indicator. So everybody has this. I've got it to a six month graph and I'm just gonna turn it to April 27. So this was kind of the leader uh, two door and you, you'll notice that the, the entry signal really came after this gap up uh, over here at the left. But this was a pretty good entry after a pullback. And then we started to break out from there. So it, it wasn't a it wasn't a terrible entry by any means. And we pulled up at a really good strong rally, pulled back again, and then rallied from there. Now the five moving average and 40 moving average of the stop price kind of never faltered. It you know, it just kept going up. A little bit of a pullback here, a little bit of a valley in the stop price, but a pretty strong uh, turn there. So I kind of Kind of like that. That essay, uh, Barry, was on Friday, so you're you're welcome to go in and, and have a look at that uh, for sure and and check out my my results. <laughs> so there's two doors. So there's NGD, and uh, again, whoops, let's get to Dateline, and there is March 27th. So that was the entry day. So when you run a quick test, you would run it on March 20. Fourth, which was the day before the 27th trading day. And then it would show the results from the market open. But the Derby actually shows the results at, as purchased at the market open on March 27th. And what a great entry that was. Uh, we love this trough of the RT40 and a very strong thrust on the five moving average of RT. So pretty strong. Okay. And then if we look at uh, CXB, you know, the rally really started back here. But of course, um, what I was looking at was the market timing, and that was favorable here. Uh, although for gold uh, and silver, market timing could have been earlier as well. Not as big a trough, but a little bit of a trough and a rally from there. And finally, the last one, if if you bought into this one early on on March 27th, you could have made money, but you had to get out near this uh, peak uh, up here, and the five moving average of RT did cross below the 40. So I, I'm just suggesting this is a bit of an exercise that you can do um, to check out some of these strategies and the searches. When you click on the strategy, you can click on show search description. So right in the derby, you'll see the sort that I've been speaking about. This is VST divided by actual price descending. And of course, anything to the right of the divide sign is the weak element. So this is a low priced um, strategy with high VST uh, ratings is, is the concept there. And so you can kind of go through and and just kind of just highlight. Here's nickel. Uh, here's datacom that we didn't see before. So you can right click on those 
and I'm just checking it out with the near perfect indicator to see how well it found the best entries for you and where it found the weaker entries. So here was a bit of a bull flag and that flag lasted for quite a long time. And then we did get a very nice uh, breakout on nickel and over 40% gain. DCM, a lot of our Canadian members are right on top of this one. Uh, we found it uh, very early and it's continued to rise beautifully. And again, from a, from a trough of the price cycle wave, very, very important. All right, so I wanted to show you that. Hopefully you can do some research yourselves on the weekend and uh, see if you uh, can can spot these these excellent uh, entries using this pretty terrific research uh, tool that is the Derby. So from here, I just wanted to take a minute and go to the Unisearch and I've highlighted here trends, new stuff. For those of you that don't have the Pro Trader add-on module, maybe you don't have VectorVest Premium real time, uh, and you haven't uh, purchased the Pro Trader add-on module. The trends, new stuff finds these new buy-rated stocks, and that can be very helpful for you. You just need to to come in. Let's see what date did I use here? I used today or Friday, I should say. So just looking for candidates, and you see here we're in a trough with Prairie Sky and the five moving average of RT did just break out. We got the new buy. So we've got some potential with this one. I'm just a little concerned about, well, it's just, just ready to break out above resistance. So, so that new buy search can be a very nice, this one I, I like quite a bit back here <laughs> when it got the first new buy, uh, but uh, it's still one worth keeping an eye on because, again, it's setting up for a pretty nice bull flag, right? So we just need to see that breakout above the flag, and then we're off to the races. All right. And then just uh, coming to the near-perfect indicator to give you some ideas of stocks that I'm looking at for next week. Should the market break out, and I should show you that market timing graph, but I'll just do that in a second. And we just go to the near perfect indicator. So those of you that do have the Pro Trader add-on module, uh, you've, you'll find these two searches, the NPI crossing one day, NPI crossing three days. And just like we did with those derby graphs to find the best candidates, that's kind of what we're, we're doing here. So we graph them all using the near perfect indicator graph. And so Ivanhoe just starting to break out. We're in a trough, in a, in a bit of a consolidation here right now with some resistance overhead. So not the ideal candidate. SIL, a breakout, not the ideal. And Air Canada, I really like this one. Had some great news on BNN in Canada, the broadcast news network, and a, a nice breakout gapped up. I think it's got some room to continue and get up to uh, uh, certainly up to this resistance area here at about $23 at least. So so this is how you can find some pretty terrific candidates. Again, some consolidation, but a breakout of the five moving average above the 40 on RT. Hexo, I really like this one. Marijuana stocks are one of the derby uh, leaders uh, from the weekend, and you can see the five moving average very, very strong thrust to the upside above the uh, 40 moving average of RT. Nice little trough breakout here. Uh, I just think this is, of all the candidates, this is the one that I have my eye on uh, the most. There's sort of the support area and the breakout. All right, just trying to keep an eye on the chat if there's any questions, but I hope this has been helpful. Uh, I could go through a, a whole bunch more charts. When you look at the uh, the one day crossover, obviously you're getting the five moving average of RT crossing on that day, and you're going to see some great candidates. Uh, here's West Fraser uh, Timber, uh, which has been struggling a little bit, but trying to break out of this consolidation. And then if you want to see a few more stocks, the NPI crossing three days will give you a lot more stocks to look at. Uh, Blackberry uh, is one that I was looking at there, and I'll just quickly um, show that in the graph area. The technology play, but a really strong thrust of the five moving average of RT. So 
keep an eye on the color guard. Watch this market timing graph. Uh, here's here's how I like to draw sort of the trend lines up at the top here, the resistance area, just starting at the top and bringing it down, and then starting here and bringing it up. And so we've got this little uh, pennant uh, with an upward motion and. Uh, right at the bottom, there's our support area. Let's see if it'll keep going from there. But just know that we did get the DEW just recently on Thursday and uh, just be a little bit cautious. But we do see the buy sell ratio, you know, near that that historically uh, oversold condition. So I think there's some optimism that we can show there. So uh, with that, uh, Jerry, I'm going to turn it back to you. And uh, thanks again, everyone, for coming out and spending your Saturday morning with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Stan. Uh, Stan, as far as I understand, one question came in about the Derby. Um, we only have real-time data for the US and Canada markets, but if you do take out a, a Derby trial, you get both, right? Re a US I, Derby and, Can and Canada Derby. I believe that's the case, Jerry. Uh, we, yeah. we certainly ha have the Derby in uh, Canada. Yes. There might be that, that data fee uh, to consider, I'm not sure. Mm. But but uh, anybody signing up, I'll, I'll actually recommend you call support yeah. when you're setting it up and get the very best de deal and get the best details. And yeah. uh, again, 30 day trial, which would convert. That's just the way it's set up. But you need to diarize that that uh, date and make sure you want to continue. I, I know you're going to love it if you if you give it give it a try uh, for a few months for sure. Yeah, I love the Derby. And Stan, thank you for the uh, the sort cheat sheet there. That was nice. Yeah. We're <laughs> always getting questions about those sorts and what what does it mean when you divide and multiply and add uh, add indicators. And if you guys, if, if after you look at that cheat sheet, if there are any of those that aren't in the program, just give our support department a call. They'll always walk you through building those. You might have to use the custom field builder to do that, but uh, that was great. That's going to help out a lot of a lot of folks for sure. All right, Stan, thank but, you very much, guys. Up next, um, we have Dr. David Paul. He's going to dive in a little deeper to the UK and the US markets. You know, Stan, you know, as well as Stan, Stan and I and David, you know, we teach a lot of courses together, a lot of swing trading courses together. And uh, uh, you're going to you're going to really enjoy this next presentation. Again, he'll dive a little bit more into the UK and US markets, go into a market timing graph for uh, and uh, uh, for both markets and look at some stocks here. So. Uh, take it away, David. How you doing, my friend? Yes, Jerry. Good afternoon to you. <clears throat> Let me you see too. if I can enough wet to share the screen. Uh, there you just go. Let All me set. Know. Can you see the screen there, Jerry? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Excellent. Excellent. Well, good afternoon, everyone, from a very wet London. Uh, so uh, it's been raining all day here, and uh, uh, so uh, I'm going to try and be as quick as possible because I know Susan's got an awful lot to say. So uh, uh, let me uh, proceed apace. I have to put up the UK specific disclaimer. Although I'm qualified to give financial advice, I can't do so because I haven't sat down with you and done a long and a detailed fact find. I'm allowed to talk about stocks that I hold myself, but I have to make it very clear that although those stocks are suitable for me, they may not be suitable for you. So that said, we can move on. Uh, and uh, 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 I, I'm starting with the US market uh, because uh, I, one of my core beliefs is that what happens across there happens very quickly, uh, this side of the pond. So uh, I'm starting the US market, and uh, uh, that's a snapshot uh, of the uh, color guard. And as you can see, we're in a down, down situation, uh, and we've got a confirmed down in our hands. The confirmed downs have done a darn good job because they've been in place now uh, through all, uh, throughout all of this. It's been one hell of a week. And uh, it's hard to believe that it's only uh, uh, last Monday that uh, JP Morgan stepped in and bailed the New Republic Bank out. It seems about a year ago, but it's only a few days ago. So there's been one hell of a lot to uh, happen during the course of the week uh, uh, and uh, by the Fed as well. So uh, uh, let's just have a look. That's uh, yesterday's big number. And now uh, a, a lot of reporters this morning are reporting, certainly in the London fin the Financial Times, that uh, uh, 
we surprised in the upside with yesterday's non-farm payroll numbers. But when you actually, uh, uh, February and March were actually put down. And if you actually look at the last three months moving average of non-farm payrolls, you can see that the Fed's five, the Fed's uh, 5% is actually having an effect because a uh, number of new jobs on a three month rolling average seasonally adjusted uh, is falling significantly. And I got that from the Labour Department. Uh, so the Fed's uh, interest rates are having an effect. Uh, so uh, I, I think they said they were going to put a, a, a top on interest rates around about 5%. Uh, and I think that inflation will fall markedly. Uh, over the next month or two. So uh, hopefully we've seen the height of interest rates, the Forex market certainly voting like that. Uh, now, if we look at the stock market itself, I make my uh, a habit of looking at what's called the Commitment of Traders Report every weekend. And uh, this looks at the positioning of the largest uh, traders in the world. And the American futures market uh, is the most short it's ever been in history. Uh, right back, we look right back here to the housing crisis, the US dollar downgraded, the Greek default plus uh, in 2011, that was the last time we had this uh, standoff about the debt ceiling as well. Uh, COVID plunge was here. So this market, um, huge amount of short contracts. And there's two things going to happen, folks. It's either going to crash or those fellows are going to have to cover. Uh, and uh, if they start to cover, we're going to see a run up, an incredible run up. If you've ever been in a bear squeeze, you'll know that it's not a very pleasant place to be. Uh, so uh, uh, if we have a look now at the, uh, and those numbers uh, came from Goldman Sachs. Uh, uh, if we look at the uh, US market timing chart, uh, that's the weekly chart since COVID. And we can see clearly, at least I can see clearly, this uh, impulsive move up uh, where markets are making new lows. And that low, in fact, is a mile higher than that top. And then all of a sudden we go into this much more corrective phase. And uh, although uh, this has been painful, all we've had here is a 62% retracement of the run up, which is perfectly normal for any form of market. So uh, we're also starting to chart a little bit of a, a rounded sort of smiley face here. Uh, the stochastic has shown, uh, this is a weekly stochastic, has shown uh, prices are rising, indicators falling, that's called reverse divergence. It's very positive. We actually have a look uh, over the last couple of weeks, we can see that there's wicks on those candles, and that's what technical analysts refer to as tweezer bottoms, uh, which is quite positive indeed. So there's been a huge amount of bad news thrown at this, and this market just doesn't want to fall at all. Uh, so I, th I think there's a high probability that a lot of future traders are going to be caught in their own foot. Uh, so uh, that's the daily chart of the same thing. That's my uh, eight day stochastic in this case. And as you can see, this eight day stochastic is in fact showing a little bit of what's called normal divergence here. Uh, and uh, uh, that uh, in fact, uh, I think precipitated that price move up that we saw on Friday. Now the move up that we saw on Friday was great. Uh, one of the best moves I've seen in a long time. However, folks, the move up happened on relatively low volume on Friday. Uh, the volume on Friday was 18% lower than the average uh, volume on Wall Street on Friday. So that's, that, that's a worry. Prices rising uh, without a huge increase in volume is always a worry. Uh, so if we have a look at the uh, standard vector vest layout, you can see that over the last year, we've been uh, trending uh, within a fairly marked range here. And uh, uh, you don't have to be a rocket science to see where the support and the resistance was. And at the moment, we're sitting between the devil and the deep blue sea. Markets are vastly oversold, but as we all know, uh, they can stay oversold longer than we can stay solvent. So uh, 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 this has pushed up a little bit in the last couple of days, as Stan accurately reported earlier. Uh, but that divergence over one or two days, I, I don't think matters a great deal to tell you the truth. So uh, uh, the close on the American markets 
the monthly closes over the last, sorry, the weekly closes are a handful of points with uh, apart over the last uh, four weeks. The DEW, well, it got caught with its underwear in a bit of a bundle here. And uh, as you can see, called excellent signals the way, but at the moment the DEW is down, been down for the last couple of days. So every measure on VectorVest of the US market is down. Uh, and uh, I think that before, there's no hurry here, absolutely no hurry at all. I think that the charts are showing that stop losses must be managed proactively and they should be acted upon without fear or hesitation. Uh, nevertheless, as Stan said earlier, there's cause for optimism here, but there is time and markets will turn. They turn in a very prescribed way. Uh, we'll start to get the primary wave turn up. We'll start to get a green light. We'll get a black star on the green light. We'll get the DEW turning up. And then finally, we'll get a confirmed call moving up. So there's no great hurry. Uh, but I, I, I'm not uh, that pessimistic. This is the S, uh, SPX. And those of you that don't know me will know, uh, won't know that I use bar charts in my work. And if you see something of mine which has got bar charts on it, you'll know that that's something I'm trading myself. Uh, this is the uh, SPX. I trade it every day for a living. Uh, and uh, in this bit, it was really difficult. I must admit, but the volatility started to move up and down again, and I've had a very good couple of weeks based on that. This bit here, I managed just to uh, keep my head above water. Uh, uh, this setup has stood me in good stead for a very long time. It's something that I teach in some of the short term courses. It's called a surprise attack. If you get two down bars and uh, in a row, and if the darn thing closes in the top, sorry, in the bottom 20% of the range, if the market then breaks up in one day through the high of the second bar, it really has a go. That's called a surprise attack. Now, you can live in that alone, folks. Uh, uh, so there's another surprise attack that happened on Friday. See, two down bars, closes in the bottom half of the bottom 20% of the range, and then in this case, it actually went up on the overnight market, opened up and then flew up uh, on Friday. I didn't get all of the move, but I got a bit of it. Uh, so uh, that is the uh, intraday market on the SPX. Uh, and uh, those are my trades last week uh, to try and keep the wolf away from the door. Uh, short there. Uh, now, this is a, a Gartley pattern uh, and made famous by a guy called Harold McKidley Gartley in his book in 1932. Uh, as you can see, this market went right to that Fibonacci level, that's 62% retracement. That's where the smartest money had their orders. That was just the Fed, okay? Uh, I didn't uh, trade in here because I was seeing customers out in the beautiful spa town of Leamington. So uh, thank you, those people, because that saved me money. I've lost money in there. Uh, I was out in Oxford yesterday. I missed the first move up, but that flag was just too good uh, to resist. And there's a few points made there. So that's how I spend my day, folks. So I, I know every nook and cranny of the SPX. Uh, uh, that's the overnight market of the SPX. And uh, it came down after the Fed talk. And as you can see, it came down in what technicians refer to as a falling wedge. Uh, and this is an hourly chart, and that's my broker's chart. And uh, uh, there's five waves in this, one, two, three, four, and five. And uh, that's was the buy-in point just there, but that takes a great deal of what I refer to as testicular fortitude to be able to do that. Uh, but it pulled back quite nicely. And that was my little flag in there, folks. So uh, that was quite a predictable bit of trading. Um, uh, and sometimes having access to the overall market, you can see the structure of the market a little bit better. Uh, uh, there have been an awful lot of great moves in tech stocks. Uh, 
over the last little while. I haven't had a, a great deal of time and I haven't been in the best of form, as many of you know. So I've just focused on the QQQs myself. Uh, and uh, this is uh, just a textbook bear flag, bull flag on the uh, QQQs. Uh, as you can see, it's sitting. Uh, it's called a flag because it looks like a flag on a pole on a, a day where the wind's not blowing that hard. Five, five beautiful waves inside it. Sometimes writing with this mouse is difficult. One of our customers again in Oxford said that my charts turn into what looked like his recent ECG. Uh, so uh, this moved up and uh, then I added to the position here. This is a, another uh, setup that I teach in the short term trading course. It's called a Wyckoff Spring. Uh, and it moved up very nicely on Friday, very nearly got stopped on that pullback, uh, but didn't. So uh, hopefully that that's going to keep going uh, come Monday. So there's still a bit of legs in that QQQ move. The target's up uh, here somewhere. So, uh, But there's probably more aggressive ways of harnessing that uh, in individual stocks. But as I say, I haven't had the presence of mind to do that. Uh, now, if we go to the UK market, uh, the UK market's in a similar situation, uh, uh, down, down, uh, we've got a confirmed down in place. Uh, on uh, Thursday, the Bank of England is going to raise interest rates, pretty much everybody expects, to 4.5%. The March inflation numbers put the final nail in the coffin, and that's had a, that's had a, a result in that uh, the forex market believes that America, the US, is probably not going to put up again. And the uh, Fed funds market is, in fact, discounting two uh, interest rate reductions over the next nine months or so. Uh, cable, the pound against the dollar, uh, uh, is trading at 126 on the back of this. And that's off a one year low last October of 106. So that's a huge move uh, in uh, the pound against the dollar. Uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, very welcome it is too. That's the UK market, pretty much the same. Uh, if anything, the UK market been stronger than the American market, hasn't pulled back as far. And the old smiley face seems to have got more uh, smile in it, this side of the Atlantic. Uh, again, uh, a very strong impulsive move and very, Corrective move, more, much more corrective in the US market. Corrective move is where the market, in fact, impinges. You can see how that high is actually higher than that. You're getting what uh, uh, Elliott Wave people call uh, an overlap. Again, the stochastic uh, is uh, got legs in it still, and the stochastic is showing this reverse divergence on a weekly chart uh, quite strong. So uh, if I now go to the uh, uh, Confirm calls. Uh, again, we're in an oversold situation. Buy sell ratio much better than in the US at 0.74, uh, but still less than one. Uh, I don't see a great deal of divergence except over one or two days. Uh, and as you can see, we're stuck in this miserable range that we've been in in both countries. Uh, I think maybe if S Susan speaks later, uh, the French market has uh, been the one market that's really kicked off this lethargy. I don't follow it greatly, but a friend of mine who does and who trades in it for UBS uh, tells me that it's driven by uh, luxury stocks that are up on the back of uh, China reopening, the Chinese huge market for luxury goods. So you can see that we're on a confirmed down situation and this confirmed up really didn't come to anything at all. This was a really great signal here. Uh, uh, the, the DEW uh, is still hanging in there. And a little bit of a flag on this as well, but it's still hanging in there. Uh, so uh, that's that's the situation in the UK. I've uh, in uh, this run up since last November, I've got myself back into the market. I'm 60, but 60% 60 invested. Uh, and uh, on Monday afternoons at my Q&A, I go through those in detail with uh, everybody. Uh, and uh, I have to make it very clear that they're suitable for me. They may not be suitable for those people that are listening. If the FCA should be listening. Uh, now, in terms of commodities, I got this from Goldman Sachs. 
a very good friend of mine works there. Uh, and uh, uh, their chart and the next chart, which I think maybe is more useful, it's the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index in relation to the S&P 500 going back to 1970, showing that commodities are vastly oversold in relation uh, to the S&P 500. So I'm personally very bullish on commodities right across the board. Uh, and as you can see, this is the most oversold this has been. But remember, this is a long term chart. That's 10 years, folks. So we're not looking at a five minute chart here. Uh, so uh, uh, it could take six months, it take a year, it could 18 months and you wouldn't even see it down here. But nevertheless, there is potential in commodities. I think uh, that gold needs to pull back a little bit. Uh, and uh, that's the gold chart. It's my broker's chart. Uh, and uh, this is a weekly chart. Uh, again, a textbook Wyckoff Spring here. Five waves up. I think we need a pullback here. But nevertheless, sometimes when the market moves, it tends to really go. Now, uh, one of my mentors, a guy called William Delbert Gann, uh, uh, always said that markets break on the fourth attempt. One, two, three. And I think that we'll actually break on the fourth attempt here. Uh, so uh, 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 my advice to the UK customers uh, is that uh, you should have a list of gold stocks. And I think that they should be accumulated into weakness over the next three to five uh, weeks. Uh, I'm holding the GDX. Those of you that know my work will know that I love the 78% retracement of the market came off. Uh, this 78% retracement uh, to the tick. As you can see, a huge amount of accumulation going on there. This is a weekly chart over a couple of months at that level. Uh, uh, we traded at VectorVS UK anyway. We traded this bit up and it pulled back and uh, back in again. And hope, hopefully, I'm going to hold that. Now, this is again as a textbook Gartley pattern. This is a bullish Gartley. One I showed uh, previously was a bearish Gartley. So uh, very bullish on gold stocks. I think that there could be three to five weeks of a pullback first. And that's the daily GDX. And as gold came back on Friday, as the stock market rose, uh, gold came back and uh, the GDX came back with it. I'm going to try and hang in there. Copper. Uh, and, and copper has given us a uh, my my go to commodity analyst tells me that I should put everything I've got into into copper, uh, but he doesn't trade himself. Uh, the fundamental and the macro for copper are incredibly good, but as you can see, it's struggling to get up here and the technical situation seems to have changed uh, and become much, much more bullish. Uh, we've got this support level in place. It was well off its lows on Friday. Commodity stocks were ticking up on Friday. So we need to watch this level carefully. But um, I think that there's a great deal of legs in uh, the co uh, commodity market uh, over the next two to five years. Uh, I have a very large position in this company called BlackRock Oil Minerals, which is a uh, an investment trust. It's got all the big usual suspects in there. And I think pretty much everybody in VectorVS UK has got a bit of it. We've been riding it since down here sometime. Uh, this uh, is worrying. There's no doubt about that. I thought we were out of the uh, woods here, but uh, the darn thing uh, seems to uh, want to pull back. So that definitely is a line in the sand. I'm hoping we won't get anywhere near that. And from a FIB aspect, that low was 62% of the last range. So hanging in there. Uh, this is a small miner. This is a, uh, a copper miner in Spain that I particularly like the look of. And I, I think that uh, if you apply uh, the near perfect indicator to this, you'll get a good signal. But in terms of uh, old money, if you uh, uh, waited for a close above that inverse head and shoulders reversal or a buy signal from VectorVest, I think you'll be well rewarded. And that's the target in this thing would take us right up a long way. Uh, so uh, that's a, uh, quite strange. It's a copper miner in a first world country in Spain. Normally they're in God forsaken places. Uh, uh, now, the oil market, the oil market uh, gapped up 
on the OPEC announcement. It's come back and filled that gap. As you can see, this resistance uh, became support and we're nearly back there. It was back up a bit on Friday with the stock market rising. Uh, uh, this has been a very difficult ride after this lovely move up, that's for sure. Uh, uh, that is Shell. I'm holding Shell. I think everybody in Vective S UK is holding Shell from about eleven pounds. Uh, again, there's a huge. This is over since 2017. That's a huge six-year uh, inverse head and shoulders reversal. Left head, right shoulders. I hope. And the target up here is very impressive indeed. I've added to the thing two or three times along the way and still hanging in there. I think that there's legs in it. And uh, this is LNG. This is an American market. And for those of you, again, that have got the testicular fortitude, this is exact, and you believe in oil, this is exactly the place to buy it, okay, at that support level. Uh, and uh, now uh, this is Occidental. Uh, again, you can see earnings per share rising strongly. MACD giving a big reverse divergence signal. And if you buy into it on Monday, you've got you can swagger into the golf club because you got yours at a better price than Warren Buffett because he bought a month ago. Uh, so uh, that's bragging rights for a long time. So that's Occidental. Uh, natural gas is on a 30 uh, week low. Market's exceptionally quiet. Uh, and I think it's building a base down around there. And uh, Advective SUK, we're watching, uh, we're watching uh, several natural gas stocks. So uh, uh, I think that uh, I'm, I'm optimistic about the stock market, but it's, there'll be plenty of time to get in. And I think that gold and commodities have got a great future. Uh, maybe three to five weeks to wait on gold. Thanks very much, Jerry. Sorry I ran on. I'm sure I didn't. No, David, thank you so much for that. Really appreciate it. It's been, it's a trader's market for sure, right, guys? Particularly here in the U.S., 401ks, retirement portfolios underperforming, but it's a, it's a swing trader's market. I know a lot of swing traders, particularly in our swing trading coaching group, some of the swing trading courses that we teach are doing very, very well very, very well using those technical setups, technical indicators, shorter term moving averages. So just got to pay attention to the indicators. Uh, but thank you, David, for that. Uh, just a reminder, guys, in, on your YouTube page, you'll see the link to the LA two-day investment seminar. You guys want to register for that. You'll see the link on the YouTube page, uh, the page that you're watching and, and uh, commenting, vectorvest.com slash LA, LA. Okay, and that's coming up in a couple of weeks. So last segment of today, uh, I'm going to introduce Susan Hayes, Susan uh, Hayes Cullenton. I uh, hope I pronounced that right, Susan, sorry. Uh, she is our managing director for Vectorvest Europe. She resides in Ireland. You're going to love her accent. Uh, she's going to talk about uh, earnings. We're in uh, earnings season, kind of the tail end of earnings season, and it's been pretty pretty good, actually. Uh, I think we're close to 80 to 90% of the S&P 500 companies reported, almost 80% reported better than expected numbers. So uh, a little bit of a surprise there, I think, for, for most people. So she's going to talk about taking the pulse on this week's earnings. Welcome, Susan. Thank you very much indeed, Jerry, and thank you for the kind introduction to my accent as well. Yes, it is <laughs> the real deal, that is for sure. <laughs> so hello, everyone, and uh, really great to be here in such star-studded company as well, I have to say, with Stan and with Jerry and with Dr. David Paul. It's, it's great to be here. So there's three things that I would like to talk to you about today. Number one is what has happened this week around interest rates. We've had a indeed on uh, I, and I watched the press the press conference as it was happening with Jay Powell on Wednesday. And then I was also watching with a lot of interest what happened on Thursday at the ECB. But well, then, of course, and David already referred to this, then we had a bit of a surprise on Friday when the payroll reports were out and they were better than expected because it was very much on Thursday. The conversation was, OK, it looks like the US is now pausing its interest rate increases. It's after its 10th consecutive one, fastest move in 10 years and sorry, fastest move in 40 years. Apologies. And then it was a game of, well, is now the ECB and the US moving in different directions because the ECB increased interest rates seventh consecutive time. Inflation is not down as far at all in in um in the in Europe as in comparison to the US. 
But, and here's where I'm going to share my screen here now for a moment, here is where I'm just going to pick up on why this is really interesting from the stock market's point of view. So let, let me just walk you through a couple of stories here in essence, is that first of all, the US added 253,000 non-farm jobs last month, according to a report of the Bureau of Labour Statistics on Friday, confounding expectations of a slowdown. And in addition as well, it was following through with uh, significant wage growth. Now, what I find really interesting about this is let's think through the mind of an investor two years ago. Well, they were getting absolutely nothing if they were going to save, if they were going to save on government at government bonds or if they were going to save in a checking account or in even in a savings account, they were getting very, very little. Now, what do you do with that? Well, you either leave it there. And of course, if we go to two years ago, well, then that probably didn't matter to a large degree because we had very little inflation. So the other alternative is that you pursue the commodities, for example, that David was talking us through there, or indeed that you were going to move up the risk curve and move into maybe investment grade debt, high yield debt, and then arrive in the stock market. Now, contrast that with where we are today. And, and I want to really look at this because when we look at where money has been going, I mean, we look at the year of 2022 and we look at money that has left the stock market and we look at the mind of the investor today. So we have got very significant inflation. That is true. Whether we go to the UK and particularly in the UK, it's, it's highest of, of all of the all of the developed market regions that we've been referring to today. So if we look at the UK or we look at Europe or, or we look to the US, we have got very significant inflation. But the difference between today and two years ago is let's just take a look at what interest rates are at the very retail level. So right now, if I'm in the US and I want to put money into a savings account, I, I can I can probably get maybe around half a percent. But what about if I was to put the money into interactive brokers? OK, so I'm just going to put it in here into interactive brokers. I'm going to put in my money on, on the, I'm just going to leave it there. So it's an idle cash balance on a stock broking platform, not a bank, not a checking account, a stock broking platform. And I listened to the earnings report from interactive brokers. Uh, this was out about two weeks ago, and this is one of their absolute driving forces of how they're competing in the market and their 20% their net account growth. And if you look at it over here, interactive brokers now, and by the way, back then, the interest rate increase that happened this week hadn't happened yet. Now, interactive brokers are offering 4.58% on an idle cash balance. Now, you might say then, because I looked at where everybody is tuning in from, if you're in the US, that sounds great. But what if you're in a different part of the world? Well, I had a look at that. And actually, interestingly, if you're me based in Dublin and obviously your account balance is in euro, what they're offering right now is 2.258%, but only on balances over 100,000 euro. Whereas up here in the US, it has to be just over $10,000 and indeed you get 4.58%. Now, the earnings report I'm going to refer to this week in detail is Apple. If I was to put my money in Apple, again, simply indeed in dealing with Apple Pay, they now have a high interest bearing account with Goldman Sachs offering 4.15%. And if I was to go further afield, and which I did, and you can do so on very much a cursory Google, if I was to go further and I was to try to find interest, high interest rate accounts in the US for my retail balances, I could get over 6% or close enough to 6% today. Think about that. Think about everything that David Paul and also that Stan has been showing you when it comes to market timing, when we look at the confirmed down calls across the board, when indeed you look at my market, and I'm taking ownership of the European market at the moment, but uh, David Paul did mention there that so far, European market is up 7.38% a year to date. And he also mentioned how in the past month, an awful lot of that hasn't really happened yet. If we look around the world, and if we were to look at global indices, Really, 6% risk-free is very, very appetizing in comparison to the stock market at the moment. And again, that is risk-free. Now, of course, we have big conversation this week all around the regional banks. Again, if I was to listen to Bloomberg or CNBC two weeks ago, we may not have heard anything about the regional banks. If we were to go back three weeks ago, we would have heard everything about the regional banks and right into the, right up to the, the round about the middle of March. Of course, the conversation was all about the regional banks. And yes, there was one taken over on Monday and then there was another one taken over on, on Thursday when we had Pacific Life as well. So what when, sorry, Pacific Bank, I should say. So when you take into consideration that conversation around interest rates, it's not just about, of course, the amount you're going to get, but the safety associated with it. So I could elaborate on all those points, but let's bring it back to the stock market is we have to now consider 
that it's not just today about what opportunities the stock market offers. It's what opportunities the stock market offers in comparison to another very lucrative asset class now that isn't difficult to access. We don't have to lock up money for long periods of time. An idle, an idle cash balance in a stockbroking account. Apple Pay, where I and, and of course then there's pay and pay now later, buy now, pay later. On, on, an, on a mobile device, I can now get into these. Looking at investor or deposit apathy, it's, it means a different thing these days. So I think it's important that we start off in that context and bearing in mind where, where that's going. So if we do now indeed move on to the big earnings release of this week, and there has been several, is we, let's go across over here to Apple. Now, what I have done is I have brought up the, I want to bring up a summary first, um, a summary of the Apple's earnings first of all, and then I listened to the earnings call itself, and then I also went through the transcript, and I just want to bring some points to you um, that delve a little bit more deeply along the way. And just as I'm going to do that, I am taking a look here at what people are, are talking about now in the chat. And it's interesting. I see here that people are saying, where could you get 6% in the US? I found three places to get 6% in the US. You can go go and take, take a look around. I, I don't need to be talking about where that's coming from, from a personal finance point of view, but you'll find it. And indeed, another commenter here is saying, hey, Susan, Indian Bank offering 7.1%. Like the idea that this would have been possible two years ago was just, it was a world, a world away. And indeed, a week can be a long time in the stock market. Two years can be immeasurably long in the financial markets. But I think we have to bear these in mind as we go. So what happened with Apple? Well, first of all, the earnings came out on Thursday night. It's we are indeed coming to the end of a, of a busy earnings season. I will I, I would like to reinforce what David said there about the market just doesn't want to seem to go down. Um, and a lot of bad news has been thrown at it indeed. And there's been a lot of conversations around mild recessions or recessions in general or cost of living crises, etc. And there there has been the commentary, which is why isn't this market taking it? And we have to bear in mind one particular thing, I think, and that is employment. Jay Powell this week said we have two jobs here in, in the Fed. And this is in, in marked contrast to the ECB. We have two jobs here, full employment and price stability. Now, price stability, of course, poses a challenge, but full employment. He, and he, I quote him. He said that employment in the US, unemployment in the US is at a 50 year low. And what we saw on Friday was an even lower 50 year low. When you think about the ability for people to keep up with inflation, a lot of that is driven by wage increases. They were announced on Friday. We can see those happening across the world. Inequality, yes, wage increases all across the board. So we have to think about why isn't the market shrugging this off? Well, it's to pick up on what Jerry mentioned as well, is that companies have been A, delivering uh, from an earnings point of view, and B, they've been delivering against estimates. And that's pretty much what, what Apple did. Now, it did start off, revenue was down. OK, so quarterly revenue, 94.8 billion. That was down 3% year over year. And then the earnings per share came in at 152. This was in comparison to what the analysts expected at 143. So it beat them. Even though revenue was down, it beat them. And we had a really strong performance then uh, in, in Apple yesterday. And in comparison to last year, net income was slightly down 25.01 billion to uh, 24.1 billion and revenue was down from 97.28 billion. They pointed out a number of times in the transcript as well how much foreign exchange was against them from that point of view. So we have to bear that in mind. And as I say, I'm going to delve right in to understanding what happened at Apple and what elements that we need to understand to make sure and really figure out what's happening. And I'm going to compare it to the uh, to the Q1 earnings report as well. In essence, when it comes to comparisons at the granular level of the products, so the iPhone, as you can see here, that outperformed. The est estimation, the Mac was down. Uh, the iPad was down slightly, but but down. And when I say down, relative to estimates is what I'm talking about. Wearables, home and accessories was up, and that was an area that Tim Cook referred to a number of times. And services, they actually set a, a services record there, slightly below estimated, but it was certainly at a record. Now, they are, that's the high level, right? That is the high level. That is what drove the share price higher yesterday. But what I want to do is I want to bring you over here to the earnings transcript. And there's there's seven key points that I want to pick up on. Okay, so first of all, one is uh, indeed revenue. And as you can see, revenue came up 32 times. So I want to bring you right up there to the top. Okay, now let's start again. Okay, now 
let me bring it down here. So he was just, uh, Tim Cook said, today we're reporting revenue of 94.8 billion for the March quarter, which is better than our ex expectations. But particularly he, uh, so it was a decrease of 3%, but better than their expectations. But we set an all time record for services and a March quarter record for iPhone. So that really was was one of the, the shining lights that, that was in there. The next one then that they talked about was net income. As I mentioned, 24.2 billion. Earnings per share was at 152, unchanged uh, versus last year, higher than earnings estimates. And they generated a very strong operating cash flow of $28.6 billion. I want to come back to you with what they're planning to do with that cash flow as well. But we talked about both of those already. What I want to do, though, is I want to point out to you how often Tim Cook referred to India. Now, I have been particularly watching the markets naturally enough, as has everybody over the past while. And I remember the day that the two stores in India were, were going to, one in Mumbai and one in New Delhi. And Tim Cook was over there and it was really big and really exciting and everything else. How many times he referred to India in this transcript? So you can see here, we set records in India. Um, then he goes on here, look at the business in India. We set a quarterly record. It's an incredibly exciting market. He talks about the growing middle class. He talks about the growing consumer. He talks a lot, and, and particularly, I'm going to also search for the word proud. He talks about how proud he is, particularly of the emerging markets. And I think that's important for us to watch because this is really where Apple is, is putting a lot of its focus. I am going to talk to you about what he said about AI in, in a little while because it's just interesting what language is using around that. It didn't come into his prepared opening remarks. It only came up in the Q&A. But what is coming up a lot is the focus on emerging markets. And, and as we know, it's got a lot of competition in the emerging markets. Whether uh, as those growing, growing markets uh, come about and as they develop, the question is, where is that income going to come from and will they be as sticky as others? And I thought it particularly interesting that there was one question about China. And that what they basically, what the person basically said was, based on what you know about China, based on the fact that where you are in India today is where you were in China 10 years ago, how do you think that this is going to evolve? I thought his answer, answer was very interesting. He said, you can't compare the two. In essence, that's, that's what he said. He said, I'm just going to go down here. So th this is what the question was. And then Tim Cook says, I think every country is different and has their own journey. So I hesitate to compare too much. Again, he reinforces his positivity about India. What I do see in India is a lot of people entering the middle class. I'm hoping that we can convince some of them to buy an iPhone and we'll see how that works out. But right now it's working out well. So he doesn't make any comparison there between the two. The other thing I do want to point out to you is they also set a record in uh, China as well. Yes, and their uh, services business hit an all-time record in China during the quarter. So you also pointed that out. Now, coming back to what he wants to do on a cash basis, I just want to pick out on, on that too. Um, so what he, he's pointing out, I'm going to show you here, share repurchases. OK, two things to point out here, uh, and that is that given the continued confidence we have in our business now and in the future, our board has authorized an additional $90 billion for share repurchases as they maintain the goal of getting to net cash neutral over time. And in addition, they're raising their dividend by 4% to 24 cents a share. And they continue to plan for annual increases in the dividend going forward. Now, of course, you could look at this in different ways. Number one, the question is, Apple in its previous day didn't give out a dividend, had lots of new ideas to reinvest in, etc. Apple introduced its once-off dividend. Now it's committing to an annual dividend. It is committed to share repurchases. And that is building off share repurchases that has come in the past. But I'm interested by the fact that they're raising the dividend by 4% and at the same time they're offering high interest or high interest accounts of 4.15%. Now I know I'm not comparing apples to apples, but the point I'm making is, is that if you want to attract your high income investor, it means something very different today. A couple of years ago, anybody that would have anybody who here would have been on a, on a on a YouTube live with me, you know that I when I was looking at a Unisearch, I would have looked, for example, for a dividend yield of greater than two percent. Now I wouldn't. I'd be looking for a lot higher. It's because the bar is higher. The bar is higher now when you're trying to attract that income that income focused investor. So certainly Apple is committing to doing that and rising their their dividend by four percent does certainly do something in that regard and of course it has lots and lots of money in order to be able to pay that out but it's just a change in that committal uh, of the mood music that I, I noticed along the way now inflation it's the name of the game it was the name of the game in 2022 across across the world uh, i would say to a lesser extent 
it is the name of the game in Europe this year. I would say to a lesser extent, it's the name of the game in the US. I would say to a very large extent, it's still the name of the game in the UK. But what I was interested is in the conversation that they were having around components. And that is this piece that I want to pick out for you here. Again, it was in response to a question that was put. As you can see, it didn't come up during the prepared, the prepared remarks, but I thought it was interesting. The environment and the component side is very interesting. We've seen component prices decline during the March quarter, and we expect the same in the June quarter. So what they're saying is that they're seeing a decline in component pricing. And when you look at supply chain, they're very confident as well. Do that now too, when it comes to supply chain. So they say they're advancing re renewable energy. That comes up quite a lot more so in the, in the prepared remarks. But they are over here saying uh, we continue to invest everywhere and look for ways to optimize the supply chain. Uh, if you step back, step back and look at how we've performed over the past three years, despite this parade of horribles uh, between the pandemic, chip shortages, the supply chain has been incredibly resilient and we feel good about what we are and what our plans are. So they have resilience in the supply chain. The price of components is falling. And it sounds like that is a, a crisis of sorts that they have certainly seen to put into their past. Notable. It's certainly notable because when you look at a range of other earnings reports that are happening at the moment, they have possibly um, a wide range of responses when it comes to costs. And foreign exchange was their particular driver of an increase in cost. Well, one of them, uh, but a very significant one. It wasn't inflation in their supply chain of component prices. Labour, of course, is, is a different story. Now, I also wanted to pick up with you as well around AI. And uh, the question was put to Tim Cook about AI in Apple. And the answer was broadly similar, very similar to what he said in the last quarter as well. And I just think this is interesting because when we look at the other earnings reports of, of companies around the world, like let's take a look at Meta, right? Obviously, Meta has changed its name from Facebook to back the metaverse. Disney shut down its metaverse unit earlier on this year. Uh, and, and Meta had a super um, earnings report earlier on uh, this month. Sorry, not this month, last month. And beat on so many different elements. But the shift in conversation when it comes to technology has moved away from the metaverse very much across to AI. And of course, when we talk about AI now, we're talking about ChatGPT, we're talking about Bing, we're talking about what Google is, is doing. In fact, if you're really keeping up to date the story, you would be looking at auto GPT as well. And I've been watching all of this space with interest. So it's interesting then to me that this conversation about AI needs to be prompted in the Q&A as, as distinct in the prepared remarks. What he does talk about is wearables. Tim Cook does talk about wearables. He talks about how how in, um, how exciting it is to be creating life saving equipment, and 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 he doesn't use the term hardware or software. In essence, a combination of the both, both of them. And you know, we heard David Paul there talk about his friend who says that David Paul's charts are like his own ECG charts. He talks about the importance of wearables in in linking into ECGs and 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 other forms of 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 preventable issues that can happen, etc. That's the context in which he brings up AI. So I'm going to show you this. So he says a bit about AI. Right, here we go. So this is the question. Tim, can you talk a bit about AI? It's obviously more than the topic of the day. It seems like the topic of the year. Just how do you think about it through your products and services? I know you use it in different ways, but if you could give us any thoughts you have on generative AI, and generative AI would in essence be something like ChatGPT. And I don't know where you see it going. Not sure what you want to say in it, but I'm really curious for your take. Now, he said the same thing this time as he did last quarter, which is very little. He said, as you know, we don't comment on product roadmaps. I do think it's very important to be deliberate and thoughtful, precisely the same words as the Q1 earnings report, deliberate and thoughtful. And there's a number of issues that need to be sorted. Potential is very interesting, all this vague language. We've obviously made enormous progress integrating AI and machine learning throughout our ecosystem. And we've weaved it into products and features for many years, as you probably know. Then he goes back into wearables. You can see in things like fall detection, crash, crash detection, and ECG, these things are not only great features, they're saving people's lives out there, very similar to the prepared remarks earlier on. So it's absolutely remarkable. And so we are, um, we view AI as huge and we continue weaving it into our products on a very thoughtful basis. Now, I don't know what you think of that, but there's nothing in it. I don't see any specific elements about where he's going. It's very, very vague. It's going back to the wearables, which of course is, 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 is um, is developing very strongly and we can see how that's going but how ai is actually going to be generative ai is going to be embedded into the into the product and what's going on really at, at apple boardrooms around the world we can tell from this now 
I will say, though, and this is the next area that I want to evolve on, is that I heard a very interesting comment this week from uh, from a commenter who was discussing the really big companies and their earnings cycle in comparison to what's going on with the regional banks. And she said something that I thought was very interesting. She said, is that really big companies are now pursuing growth when they're now driving in each other's lanes or playing in each other's lanes. When we think of Apple, right? I mean, I'm an Apple user. I have the watch here, here in front of me. I'm also or on my on my on my wrist. I have an Apple iPhone here in front of me. There's there's like there's lots of there's lots of ways in which I am an Apple user myself. But what I think is particularly interesting is the fact that it's now moved into the Apple uh, the the high yield accounts and Apple pay now or buy now pay later. I think I think that that's very interesting that that is what's happening. So he was asked about that and where is this going? So I'm just going to show you what he says about this. And the question particularly was, is Apple trying to play in this space? Or is this simply with a view to making the convenience of an Apple product even greater and integrating, as he mentioned himself, indispensably into people's lives? And let me show you what he said. Stand. Yes, here we go. So what he says is what we're trying to do with our payments is uh, with our payments work is what we're done on the watch. We're focused on helping people live a healthier day with our financial products. I'm just going to pop on over here. He said the fact that it has no fees like the savings account, which has, as you mentioned, it's very attractive yield. And that's 4.15 percent. So we're, we're trying to help users, but these things have to stand on their own. Now, that's an important distinction in my mind. They have to stand on their own. So this is something that is going to have to work on, on, a, on a standalone business basis. It's not just about keeping people into an ecosystem. These are businesses that they are expanding into that have to stand on their own two feet. And he said, but on the savings account specifically, we are very pleased on the initial response to it. It's been incredible. So I think that's um, that's that's going to that's going to be very, very interesting as well. So I'm just going to take a look over here and see what people are saying. So is Apple heading towards becoming a value company as opposed to a pure growth company? That's a very good point. I would never have considered that Apple to be a value company in its Steve Jobs days. But as it's committing to things like increasing its annual dividend, and while at the same time it's committing to share repurchases while it's driving forward in growth, it is now having more of, of those points. And I did take a look on the Vectorfest system. I just took a look at uh, what was happening over here on this note. Just going to pop on over here. Like this P ratio is a 26.57. Let's just open up here the graph for a moment. The graph. OK, so let's just take a look over here. On Thursday, Vectorfest was our Apple was very much a buy from the point of view of what Vectorfest was saying. Um, as we can see here, the, the now let me go, I have this ready for you. Now I have it even ready again. OK, so very much a, a, a very strong buy recommendation as regards also its RT was at, at 1.27. So there was plenty of, of uh, you know, buyer activity driving it up. As you can see, then it had a very, very um, impressive, strong performance then uh, yesterday. And, and from that point of view, then, if we were to look at the, the PE ratio, particularly over the past, let's say, six months, so we can see that the PE ratio has been climbing, but it hasn't been extortionate by any manner of means. So it's just interesting to watch how this is, is going to, to develop. Um, now, Michael says, AI, how do you invest in it? There's a plethora of ways. And rather than get into that right now, Michael, what I will say is that Glenn has been focusing a lot on that on, on Trending Thursdays. I've been talking about the AI technology in Savvy Investors at Vectorvest and showing how it's changing productivity and, and the interactions within the uh, the workplace and, and lifestyle in general. But particularly Glenn has been talking about that from an investing point of view. Um, let me see. Yeah, there's a, a range of other comments there that I, I will I will leave you to to talk about. So that is the key the key one that I wanted to focus on this week, and it's it's been it's been an interesting conversation. It's been an interesting earnings call. Certainly, the market's been very happy about it. But what I want to do is, as as we as I give this session, and and hopefully be invited back to give more in the coming quarters um, at the Vectorfest Inter International User Group Forum. What I also want to show you is a search that I have built so that I can see what earnings are coming down the tracks of particular interest to me. So if you pop on over here to Unisearch with me, you will see what I have in store. So I have the stock earnings date here is that I look for that to be uh, more than one day out. And then also that it is less than five days out. So that's, that helps me plan my week. What is coming down the tracks in the next couple of days so that I can see what might be of interest to get in and, and delve into. But then I also look for what is a buy recommendation. 
at the moment, and you heard Stan talk about fair, the the buy sell recommend uh, the buy sell ratios right across our world uh, at the beginning of the year or at the beginning of the session today, is that it, it, it's sometimes in when the markets are going up, it's easy peasy to find buy recommendations. When the market is going down, particularly where it was maybe last October, would have been a lot harder. So I just I personally look for stocks that have a buy recommendation because just in case any of you aren't familiar, in Vectorvest a buy recommendation is when number one. The stocks VST is above one, value, safety and timing is above one, RT is above one. That's direction, magnitude and dynamics of, of that uh, of that direction is, is above one as well, where the price is above the stop price and where the price is diverging away. So by putting in that parameter that I'm looking for a buy recommendation, it means that I have four parameters now, you know, really digging in behind and, and extracting out from me what I really might be interested in looking for. In addition as well, I well, it's baked into it there, but that I look for VST above one. And I also like to look for the growth rate being above 15%. And I just th think that it's really interesting here is that the first one up to appear on my screen is First Citizen, not to be confused with First Republic. And of course, First Citizen, for any of you who aren't familiar, is the company that ended up buying Silicon Valley Bank and doubled uh, as a result. And it's just very interesting to watch what has happened in that case. So I'll be watching those earnings there um, with interest. Now, one last thing that I want to say, and I am going to make sure that we punctually finish. So I will be handing back to Jerry after this, this very short insight that I want to share with you. And that is volatility. Um, it's It's been a volatile time in the market. Like David started off there today and the first thing he said was, wow, what a week it's been. And I could have said that about so many weeks, in fact, over this past year. And the year was you know, it's mo moving towards the middle of the year, but it is relatively speaking. It's, it's you know, we're not at the end of June yet, so we're still at the, the middle of the start, I suppose you could say. Volatility itself has fallen uh, since the beginning of the year indeed, but uh, one of the stocks that I, I was watching recently was for Carnival, and I listened to the earnings report, and I'm just going to pick out three things that stood out to me about that that earnings report, um, the earnings transcript. Um, is. There was particularly, I noted in February, right, it said, let me go back up here, there's one above this. In February, they had a record. Uh, right, here we go. Yeah. So Carnival is a cruise company that absolutely got totally written down by the stock market in COVID. And since June 2022, has done the same. Currently, the whole recommendation of VectorVest with a very significant volatility. And it's a stock that I sold puts on. In, uh, in 2020 when people had completely written off tourism forever. And it, it I, the reason that I sold puts on it at the time was I saw the RT jumping from 0.15 to 0.6 and it really made a very significant jump. So I decided, right, it's moving quickly. Let's see how I could handle that volatility and could I do something about it? So listen to the earnings call anyway, and I'm thinking the earnings call was round about, I, I must actually, sure, it's going to be up here at the top. It was, uh, yeah, 27th of March. So I noted that they had their, their best February ever, right? That was one of the things. Um, the other thing is that they're making their way towards their debt becoming investment grade. This is, they're, they're seeking to drive down their debt balances on the path back to investment grade. And the other thing, it also came from a question that was asked in the Q&A, which is, the, the, it was about their EBITDA. Just very quickly, EBITDA is earnings before interest tax, depreciation and amortization. It's basically a profitability measure that a lot of analysts would look for. So I saw over here again is that the, the, the question here was that um, their EBITDA, what they had announced their EBITDA seems incredibly, incredibly conservative, given what you're seeing from a demand perspective and spending perspective, etc. And then they go on to say that they were already 70 percent booked. All that said, the company isn't profitable, right? It's not profitable. It's, its debt was not investment grade. It's not something I would feel, and I've said this on a couple of different episodes, it's not something that I necessarily would feel comfortable holding. But on the other hand, what I was comfortable in doing was selling a put option that was out of the money. And I'm just going to briefly show you what that means. So what I did was that I opened up my options analyzer at Vectorvest, and I'm just going to show you um, what, what one might do today. So currently the share price, now, I'm just going to check that. Just, just want to be very, very sure. I have this in my viewer. The share price yet finished yesterday at 9.39, right? So it was down 0.40%. And it, it is quite a volatile stock. But I wanted to turn that to my advantage. So the stock there is trading at 9.39. And if I was to sell an option in the money this time at $10, let's say and I was going to sell that into August, right? So what's that? 
uh, June, July and August, that's three months, then um, I would be getting a premium of 120. Now, let's just think about what that would mean then. CNC, calculator, CNC. Right, so what that would mean is that if I was going to end up taking the stock on, right, which isn't, wasn't, isn't, isn't and wasn't when I sold the put, wasn't my intent. Let's just think about how I would factor this in today. $10 is the strike. If I take away 120, that would mean my entry point would be at 880. And if I divide that by today's share price, that means that I would be getting a, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Let me start again. Because I took away, let's see, let's see. Okay, right, so we have 10 minus 1.2, divide this by 9.39, Divide uh, 0.93 is, I would be getting a 7% discount on that, right? So if one minus 93% is a 7% discount. So that would mean that I would get paid to go into that stock at that level of where I'd be getting, so I'd be getting $1.20 with a view to getting a 7% discount when I would actually go in and buy the stock if I was to buy it and if I didn't close off the position in that length of time. And the other thing that I want to, the other thing, of course, that um, made me take the decision that I did is when it comes to that, that would be $1.20 is what I would receive. And I would need what $8.80 of my own money towards that if I was going to go on and take that position. And that would be 13.6% of a return in three months. So if I was to multiply that by four, that would be an annual return of 54%. So what I did was that um, I sold a put option on this. And I just checked before I came online with you today and that that put option, I'm just going to stop sharing, sharing my screen here now as I am going to be handing handing back here to Jerry. Um, I noticed that that's, that, that um, my put value fell 17% uh, this week. So the thing is, and by the way, I had sold my put option at nine, not at 10. So it is still uh, out of the money. And if that was to, if that was to if that was today. Well, then that is that is where I would find myself uh, at now of where I would simply be keeping the money. So what I would say is that when it comes to the volatility that's in the market at the moment and there's lots and lots of change, there's lots of questions asked. We do wonder why the market isn't reacting to the news that's necessarily being put forward to it. And while volatility has fallen, the news is volatile, the economy is volatile, and we are seeing divergence between central banks and markets, etc. You still can make volatility your friend. You just need to make sure, though, if you are handling options, are you looking to sell puts to take on a position? Or in my case, are you selling put options to take on the volatility while being careful about how you actually feel about that position should, should push come to shove? And on that note, with three minutes to our hard stop, Jerry, back to you. <laughs> Perfect. Nicely done. Uh, thank you, Susan, so much. Somebody asked, I think Michael asked, how, how to invest in AI stocks. Actually, within the VectorVest program, you guys can see my screen. In our overview watch lists uh, group here in the watch list section, we have two watch list AI uh, hardware providers. So Michael was asking about that. And AI stocks and ETFs. So if you want to eliminate the single stock risk, you know, you got some familiar names in here. We have some ETFs in this watch list as well, AI stocks and ETFs. And to know which ones the ETFs are, just sort by RV. The ones with uh, RV and RS indicators at one, you know that those are the ETFs. So that's a way to, to, uh, to kind of invest in the space without taking on the single stock risk. All right, so I wanted to answer that uh, for Michael. Uh, as a reminder, guys, our LA two-day investment seminar coming up in a few weeks. What's today? May 6th, so about uh, three weeks from now uh, in Los Angeles, California. If you're in the area, come see us. Ray Clark, Jim Penna, uh, Glenn Tompkins, Steve Chappell will be your instructors. It's a two-day course. Remember, it's only it's only in person. It's not a live stream like our Tampa two-day is a live stream. You can go to VectorVest.com uh, slash LA to register. You can also go to our university as well uh, if you wanted more information. When you go to VectorVest.com slash LA, I believe that'll bring it to the, the, the university and you'll have all the information there with the agenda. Um, and that's it. Fantastic. I want to thank everybody. Uh, yeah, star-studded cast here today. Susan, David, Stan, uh, fantastic job. I want to thank Joey, uh, our producer in the background, for uh, you know for bringing us live here. If you are not, or if you have not, subscribed to our VectorVest YouTube channel, please do that. You can also uh, like our video here today, share it with friends and family. Um, we'd appreciate that. You can always call our product support department for training and support. If you never ever need any help, please don't hesitate. We hate for you guys to be sitting at home and 
uh, not understanding what you're looking at or just not not knowing uh, you know how to navigate or just anything at all within the VectorVest program, please give our support department a call. Our U.S. number is the 888 number, and uh, you can see our other numbers there uh, for international uh, those international countries. The replay the recording will be available on the YouTube immediately after the webinar. Same location on the VectorVest YouTube channel. And our slides that we used here today, guys, will be sent to you on Monday afternoon. Um, you'll, you'll receive a link to those slides. Check all your folders in your email bin, spam, junk. Sometimes they get sent there. Sometimes they get uh, blocked. If you if you need, uh, need those, you can just give our support department a call as well. So I uh, want to thank everybody uh, for being here today. We are here every month. Thank you, Susan, David and Stan once again, and you guys have a great weekend. Thank you for joining us, guys.